It's okay. I'm feverishly taking notes because I did not get a chance to sit down and think about what I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> <laughs> why did I not like this book? I mean, <clears throat> um, why did I? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, if you didn't like it, I mean, you can tell me that. Then I won't. I won't be offended. Well, then I have to come up with a reason. I do hope you did like it, but... <laughs> what was the main character's name again? The girl? Mona? Mona. Yeah, I had to do a lot of reminding myself because I read this book... Was it officially last year when I read the book? No, I take that back. No, I read it back in April. <laughs> Welcome to My Hill to Die On, episode 65. Everyone has things they are passionate about. Things we want our friends to try and experience. So we've convinced each other to try different things. And we talk about these experiences to see if we can get just one more person to join us on our hill to die on. Today, besides, you know, doing my reading, the other thing I tried doing was I was playing around with Obsidian. Oh, yeah, yeah, even more? Mm -hmm. Well, it's the question of, am I going to move to using this more consistently? And I love a lot of what Obsidian does with certain things, and I really like the customization and the way that I can really embed a lot of things. But they had this one thing that was really annoying me. Okay. And it was almost a game breaker. And is this. In Obsidian, when you hit tab, it moves it into a code block. Ah, uh, indents. Yeah, indents. But indents into a code block, not just indents the line. Mm. And there's no way to turn that off, or that's your story? That's a bit of my story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I looked through every setting in the thing and could not find a way to turn it off. Struggled for a significant part of my morning. So then I decided, okay, I've been doing this on my iPad. Maybe there's an easier way to take away this code block stuff with a setting that you can do on the computer. So I go to the computer version and it's not there either. So I go onto their forums and their help website. And there are other people who have had the same problem, but well, one of the nice things about Obsidian is that there is in their settings, you can go to appearance and at the very bottom, there is CSS snippets. So you can make a CSS file that your Obsidian reads and adds that to all your stuff. So I was like, oh, that's easy. I'll just add text indent to this certain vault of files because when I'm writing like this, I'm going to want to indent. The problem is that works for their editing view, but their reading view, and if you ever export it as a PDF, doesn't abide by it? Well, it does abide by your CSS, but the problem is when it goes into reading view, if you don't put in a double space or a blank line, it doesn't create a new P tag. It doesn't create a new paragraph tag. It views it as a single paragraph tag with a BR in it. So it wasn't reading the second indent. Mm, so it wasn't indenting the second paragraph. Exactly. So eventually, after reading through forums for an obnoxious amount of time, because I was determined to either get this to work or give up. So after, yeah, no, it indents the entire thing into a code block. Doing a whole bunch of reading through things, I added something so that in the markdown view, in the preview, like the reading view, it would look at all of the BRs and then change the display to a block display. Hmm. And then I turned all of the P tags to a grid display, which only had one item in it. So it then viewed each of the pieces of text within the P as its own item. And so it would indent all of those. Hmm. So you're hacking, hacking. <laughs> I'm not hacking. I am cleverly adding css over my things so i can get proper indentation in my writing yeah you're severely changing how it works 
Mm-hmm. Well, again, I'm only applying this CSS to this very specific vault. I have other vaults that deal with it in different ways. And I wanted to do this because I like a lot of the other things that they do. I like the way that they do footnotes. I like the way they do all these ways of connecting all this information. And as I said before, my biggest problem with the previous system I was using, which was Scrivener, was the fact that the only way to properly share information between my computer and my iPad was through Dropbox. And I did not want to use Dropbox because Mm -hmm. it would mean signing up for Dropbox for one thing. And I really didn't want to go about all that. I didn't want to add Dropbox into my life, basically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I wanted to do this all within the Apple environment and through iCloud file sharing and things like that, which Obsidian does, and it does very well. That's the other nice thing about this. So I added the CSS file into this vault on my computer, and then it shared that automatically Ah, with my iPad. Hmm, That's convenient. That way, I can just go into that file on my iPad and still have all of the settings that I want. So yeah, all that to say, I like how it turned out. It has worked out pretty well for me. I'm going to play around with it a bit more, but I think that was my last hurdle before I really cave on moving more steadily in towards Obsidian because I do like a lot of the other things. It is a little bit more finicky if you're just wanting to write, which I'm okay with. I'm very happy with the way that that turned out. It took a lot longer than I expected it to. It's a little sad it took so long. That being said, it would have been solved so easily if there was just a setting somewhere in in Obsidian to just turn off the code blocks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The yeah, the meat was good. One of the disappointing things today, and it's not really disappointing today. I couldn't figure out why we ran the same course two weeks ago. And at the time, everything seemed a slight bit too fast. I wasn't exactly sure why. I mean, our runners had good times. It wasn't like our runners were like, whoa, that's really fast. The only discrepancy showed up when we ran another course the week after, and they did worse on a flatter course. Mm. And that's a little bit like, oof, wait a minute here. How can you do worse on a flatter course? That was a little nerve-wracking. And then, because I was like, well, okay, maybe the course two weeks ago, the one that we ran here, was short. So I brought myself a measuring stick today, which just takes forever to measure a course. And I realized where I went wrong. It took me a while to figure out where I went wrong two weeks ago. And I went wrong. I cut the hill down about 150 meters than it should have been, which because it's out and back course that cut 300 meters off the course. So that means that two weeks ago, we probably ran 4,700 meters as opposed to 5,000 meters. So a little short. It does make sense then that our faster runner, if you tack on something like 20 to 30 seconds to our faster runner, that makes more sense to where he finished the week after. But luckily, all sins are forgiven, at least for my team anyway, because all the runners went faster today than they went that other time anyway, even though the course measured today was 5,000 meters. Exactly. So I am very sure that the course was 5,000 today. So that, that helps out a lot. Good. Not worried now. This course has two out and back kind of things. So I didn't realize that the first one was shorter than I expected. The second one, I just made 150 meters longer to compensate. And I think I'm going to leave it that way. Instead of bringing the first out and back further out to where it should be, I'm going to leave the second one longer. I'm going to do it like that instead. And just keep it consistent. I think it's better for the runners. Mm -hmm. I feel like because we run on an American base, most of the time we're hidden in the woods. But because I had to make it 150 meters longer, we kind of peek out into the golf course, which golf people really don't like. But we stay on the road, on the paved road. We're not running on any green or fairway or anything like that. So I'm curious to see if I will get a complaint this week that we ran and then peeked out for like 50 meters. It's not even that much on a paved road. So the only real difference I see is that we crossed into the part of the base where Japanese and Americans mix because the golf course is like kind of open to Japanese. I'm not sure exactly how that works because I've never had to look into it, but the golf course is semi-open to Japanese where the base is not. 
So if anything, we crossed a line that didn't have a gate on it. <laughs> we crossed a line that was not covered in a gate where there's a bit of a distinction between where people can go. Again, I'm speaking from ignorance on this, so I don't really know what that means. But that's where I could see we might get into a little bit of water too. But again, only if somebody complains. The meat itself was fine. A few of the coaches were like, uh, this is why it was longer. Because I draw really accurate maps of the course. And a few of them are like, yeah, that's why. Did you know that we stop here instead of here? I'm like, yeah, I figured that out today. Because my maps are super accurate. So it's like, yeah, you didn't go the two turns that it requires. Like, yeah, I only went one turn. I can see that now in the map. <laughs> so they're pointing it out to me. Oh, I shouldn't draw super accurate maps. So now I'm going to have to draw another map to <laughs> mark out the slight differences that we ran. Well, at least most of the map is probably already drawn for you. You just have to redraw a new line. And the reason I got messed up was because the map has a trailhead on it. And it says you turn around at the trailhead. And for whatever reason, there must be a new trailhead because we turned around at a trailhead. I was like, oh, here's the first trailhead. This is where we turn around. And they must have made a new trail because this trail is not on the map. Any maps that I've had before, and I don't remember a trail being there before. You know, I mean, I've been here for 15 years and I haven't seen a trail there before. So that's what fooled me. And maybe I should have been paying more attention the first time. But yeah, there was a trailhead that I didn't expect to be there. So I just made the turnaround at the trailhead where it said to make the turnaround. But that's 150 meters before the trailhead should, uh, the trailhead that I was looking for is. So, oh, well. Oh, well, it'll be fine. It's a nice course. I like this course because it's deceptively challenging. It's got the hill that I made too short by mistake is a steep hill, but not something that you can't overcome. And making it shorter did make it a little bit nicer. The other trail that the other turnaround point is deceptively hard because it is a slight uphill the whole way for about 1,300 meters. So it is not short. It is a long out and back, and it is slightly uphill the whole way. And so you just get burnt out going up. And then the way back is a coast because you're just going slightly downhill the whole way, and it's just so much easier than the way up. <laughs> so it's deceptively hard. And I like that. I like that in a course that you have to be a wise runner to run this course. Or to succeed well at this course anyway. And to be honest, since we run this frequently, we're going to be running it like three more times this season. Everybody has the chance to become a wise runner on this course. I, I kind of like that too. Like, yeah, the first few times, the veteran runners will be able to run it better. Or those wise enough not to start too fast. But the more you run it, the more you'll know where to push and where to slow down and how to do it better. So I, yeah, because we run it so often, I think it does benefit many runners. So I kind of like that. Sounds good. Well, I'm glad you uh, found your missing 150 meters or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It was disappointing to learn that I had messed it up. But in the end, it's not that bad. Yeah. Technically, it was a practice meet anyway, so it really didn't matter. I didn't submit the results anywhere two weeks ago. I told everybody to time their own runners. It's up to you. In the end, it's fine. And since most of our runners beat their time anyway, it's not even going to show up in my history books. So, Ryan, I took my last picture. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh for the show notes of the drink and KitKat with my iPhone 11 Pro. Oh, so it's coming then. Uh-huh, it's on its way. So yesterday, and I found a Mac Rumors article. I got to look for this again. But I had the hardest time ordering the phone. <laughs> so I have now purchased myself an iPhone 12 Pro. 12? Oh, sorry. I purchased, <laughs> thank you. I purchased for myself an iPhone 14 Pro. <laughs> Thank you, because I was like, if you purchased a 12 this year, well, you're saving money. I had a hard time. Here it is. Apple Store experienced an issue with iPhone 14 pre-orders, and I had that problem. Because we straddled the border of being in Japan and America at the same time, right? <laughs> and I didn't get to do this. This was my hope. I wanted to buy the phone in Japan with my American credit card with my American Apple ID. And that didn't all work out properly. <laughs> I was able to buy the phone with my American Apple ID, but I had to pay with a Japanese credit card shipping to a Japanese address, which is why I wanted to ship to my address here anyway. Mm. Um, but I wasn't able to buy it with my American credit card. That was disappointing. So I couldn't buy it with my American credit card. It's disappointing. So I went through the process and tried with the American credit card. It pretty much gave an error right away. So I said, fine. Fine, I will pay with the Japanese credit card. But then after paying with the Japanese credit card, and hitting the, you know, hey, I confirm I'm buying button. 
the next page just kept spinning and spinning and spinning. So I'm like, well, did it, would it work or not? And I didn't get an email right away. So I was like, oh, it didn't work. Mm. And through the process, because I had started pretty close to nine o'clock, the web page didn't become available right at nine. It took me a little while, but I started pretty close to nine. It was going to come on the first shipping day. So I was like, great, perfect. I got in at least early enough to be on the first shipping day. Mm. But because I didn't get a success page, I was like, ah, oh, all right, I'm going to work through the process again. So I started the process up again with a brand new order. And right away it tells you, uh, now it's not going to ship till October. And I'm like, oh, already a month. I've lost a month in five minutes. <laughs> you know, <I've, laughs> It's like, whoa, okay, fine. October, fine. So I went through the process again. And just as I pushed the confirm button on the second order, I got an email saying that the first order went through. <laughs> and although the second order, I didn't get a confirmation, you know, I didn't get a, hey, success, you just bought yourself an expensive iPhone. Well, it doesn't say that, but anyway, you know what I mean. Yeah, I didn't get a success page on that one either. So I was like, well, did the second order go through? I don't know. But you know what? I'm not doing a third one, so we're waiting here. Did your second one go through? My second one went through. So now I have two. One's not coming till October which means I have plenty of time to cancel it. So, hey, do you want to buy an iPhone for me? I'll sell it to you for the same price I bought it for. <laughs> you just wait till October and it can be yours. How much did you pay for it? Well, yeah, that's the problem in Japan. It's, Japan is expensive because of the exchange rate. The exchange rate is horrible right now. Yeah. So bad. Why do you think I have held off on sending more money back to America right now? Yeah, do not send money to America right now. You will not make a lot of money. My goodness. I mean, even today at the American base, spending money there, it's like I bought a $6 box of cereal, which is about right for cereal, but then translate that into 145 yen per dollar. That's like 900 yen box of cereal. 900 yen box of cereal. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's totally worth it because it's Cinnamon Toast Crunch. So, I mean, did I hesitate? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> well played. But, you know, at the same time, it's like 900 yen. But, of course, I didn't blink an eye because cinnamon was crunch. So, pff, bought that right away. Mm-hmm. I have been good, and I am still holding off on getting a new phone. Yeah, you've been very good. How long are you going to push it? I don't know. See, there's a lot of questions up in the air, but part of it is also, like, there is a very real possibility now that I'm going to be out of debt pretty soon. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you're saving for that? Well, yes. There is that. So I will let you know once I've decided some things in my life, but probably I think your best bet is to cancel it because I probably won't buy it from you. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's okay. I wasn't relying on you to buy it from me. Yeah, you know, I would ask a little bit around some more, but I th I'm gonna I'm gonna sell it. Although our coworker said that I should take the first order, sell it on Yahoo Auction add a little premium onto it and then wait for the second one to arrive. But no, I don't think I'm going to have the patience for that either. So I'll just cancel the second order. I buy a new phone, what, every three to four years? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, you're going to push four years on your phone, which is not bad. I mean, no. I mean, I'm giving my phone to my daughter to use for another three years. So this phone, I mean, she doesn't use it day to day. Like we use our phone and she uses it differently than you use your phone too. But, you know, pushing your phone a fourth year is going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the question. The iPhone 15 will have some things that are pretty nice. The question is, I think it will have USB-C, but will it have it on all phones or will it just be the 15 Pro? Hmm. I'm questioning that. I think it could be all phones because of just legal pressure. So if you wait and get just the straight iPhone 15 next year, you know, you might you might get a phone with USB-C, which would be quite nice. I mean, that's one of the things that I'm a little bit disappointed that the iPhone 14 didn't have USB-C. Mm. But the 15 will, or at least one of them will. So, I mean, and if it's the Pro, you might not buy it because you really need because that Because I'm a cheap person. <laughs> well, like you said, you know, cameras really aren't your thing, Ryan, are they? No. And that's the thing is, like, part of the reason why I can easily push a fourth year is... Let's be fair. What do I use my phone for? I use it for listening to podcasts and texting people and occasionally watching a YouTube clip. That's about it. It is a, a mode of getting a hold of me mm -hmm. and me listening to music and podcasts. That is honestly the majority of what I use my phone for. So, you know... I'm okay pushing it a fourth year. My battery still 
is plenty good. Mm-hmm. And that usually is the clincher for me on when I get a new phone, is when the battery starts to go. I have noticed that my phone will enter the 20% mode. Mm-hmm. It'll throw up the low power mode warning every day now, pretty much. I am yeah, getting to yeah. that point. But I have, I have realized, though, that I can just hit cancel and don't do low power mode. And I'll still make it to the end of the day. So the battery is not as amazing as it was when we first received it. Mm -hmm. But I'm still lasting all day. I don't have to charge in the middle yet. And I guess I probably won't reach that stage, which is nice. This phone is quite nice. But my iPhone 7 did die. Uh, I did have to charge it up in the middle of the day before I had swapped that out. And this iPhone 11 has not gotten to that point. And apparently the battery in the iPhone 14 Pro is much bigger than this phone battery. And the size of my new phone will be slightly larger than this phone. It'll be more closer to the size of your phone, Mm. which is a little bit saddening. I mean, we had the discussion back when I bought this phone that one of the reasons I bought the 11 Pro was because I wanted the slightly smaller phone than the iPhone 11. Mm. And I think the new 14 Pro will be between our two sizes, but it'll be bigger than this phone, which is sad. But I like small. Not mini small, but I like small. Yeah. I think you picked out a great phone. I think I can push a fourth year is really the big thing. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And since I can push a fourth year, I think it's probably best that I do. And I, I probably could too if I didn't have daughters. <laughs> if you didn't have someone who is going to receive your phone after you retire it from you. Because really what I'm doing is pushing six years out of my phones. Mm-hmm. I use my phone for three and then I pass it to a daughter for three. My wife uses her phone for three and me pass it to a daughter for three. So really we're pushing six years out of our phones. And I really can't push that to eight. Apple really doesn't support that. No. So I can't quite do that. But six, six is usually the border. I mean, right now, my, my youngest daughter with the iPhone 7 that's being retired, she won't be able to update to iOS 16 on that phone. So it's good that she's getting a phone that she can. So, But I think there is often the time where the girl with the oldest phone is in danger of not receiving an update in year five. And I think we'll still mm. be in that danger, which is hard when you don't get the feature that your sisters get. <laughs> well, I know your daughters aren't probably thinking about this, but my mind would always be on like, if you're not getting those updates, you're not getting those security updates. Yeah, they're not doing enough to be concerned. Not that they're not doing enough stuff, but they're also not going out and about or clicking things that could potentially cause them to have to have fears about that. So, Well, I mean, I'm not either, but <laughs> I'm also, you know, having to think about this all the time now, so... They don't, they don't browse the web, you know, <laughs> on their phones. They play the, the 10 or so games that they like to play. Yeah, again, it is the part of me that hears the news things about, like, foreign governments who have these multi-million dollar backdoors into people's phones, which work on, like, one person's phone before it gets patched. Yeah, it's that sort of level of, like, paranoia that's slightly, slightly there in my brain. Which is why I'm like, no, no, you get those security updates. <laughs> and then I, I cry when I see our staff with like nine waiting updates. Ah, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, c'est la vie. There we go. Yep, I bought a Deep Purple iPhone 14 Pro, 256 gigabytes. Ooh, you know what? I'm glad you went with the purple because I really like the purple color. I wouldn't say purple's my favorite color. But it borders on a color that I like. Mm. It's a color that appeases me. But I wouldn't say it's a favorite color. I've had purple iPhone backgrounds. I had a purple iPhone. Actually, my iPad background is purple right now. It's just a nice color. It is a very nice color. I don't pick it as a favorite, though. I would say blue is still my favorite. Mm. But purple is a nice color. And I was thinking either deep blue or deep purple would be a phone color I would pick. And the iPhone 13 Pro color is a weird kind of blue. It's kind of a baby blue, which is not what I like. So Deep Purple came around. I was like, you know, I think, I think I'll go for it this time. Hmm. I'll probably get a case with black edges because it's just easier that way. I like my current iPhone 11 case, which has black edges. So I'll probably get a case with black edges, and then the back will be purple. So that'll be nice. Yeah. I'm happy that you're happy with your new phone so this week i 
feel like I should probably tell you about Nino Kuni. It's the second world. Yeah, basically the second world. There are two games out in this series. The first one came out in 2010, which is why I haven't really talked about it. <laughs> because it's a game quite a while back, but one that I really, really want to bring up because it is a good game. The, the first one. Uh, well, the first one's great. The second one's great. I think they might have had a mobile game as well, but I'm not 100% sure. Is it translated cross worlds or? It actually, in English, the game title is Nino Kuni. The first one that went to English, I believe the main one that it's called is Nino Kuni Wrath of the White Witch. Was really the first one that really, really got out there. Anyway. That's going to be the one that I'm going to mostly talk about is the Wrath of the White Witch. It originally came out on PS3. I think it got re-released on PS4. So the game is a role-playing game. So, you know, my <laughs> complete jam. Mm -hmm. But what was really cool about it was, first of all, it was made by a publisher named Level 5, who has made some really great games in the past and just a lot of games that I've really enjoyed. I think I might have talked about one or two of them, but the main ones that I think about are things like the Dark Chronicle, Dark Cloud series, which is a really great game. Anyway, I digress. They decided to make this game. The animated sequences of this game and a lot of the art style was produced by Studio Ghibli. Hmm. So... If you look at the actual gameplay, at the art style, and things like that, a lot of influence came from Studio Ghibli. Mm -hmm. And it is one of those games that is both really enchanting, really lovely, but personally, the first like couple of hours of the game will break your heart. No matter how old and, and cynical and jaded and me you are, <laughs> mm -hmm. you are going to have an emotional response to the beginning of this story. It's an RPG. It also had a lot of work with Studio Ghibli. You can guess it got complicated. Because <laughs> if I know anything, RPGs and all Studio Ghibli movies, completely straightforward, no confusion in plots there, no, mm -hmm. is just a very... Uh, it, it has an emotional impact, but it also has a lot of joy baked into it. One of the interesting little features in the gameplay is a lot of your interactions with other characters and a lot of your trying to get quests done involve trying to treat people with a specific emotion so that their hearts are filled in a certain way. Hmm. So, like I said, it's not only just like happy and, and joyful but there are some really heavy moments and it's got a lot of fun and joy and emotion and just love baked into this game i feel like that's me gushing about it for for enough for those of you out there who haven't played this now 11 year old game you should really go out there and play it it is a fantastic game and apparently there are a lot more mobile games for this series than I thought there were, because when I looked it up, there are the two main games and then like three mobile games. And apparently also the first game had a Nintendo DS version hmm. that was released before the PlayStation version. There's a Switch version. Yes, the Switch version came out in 2019, I think. I do really like the game. I think it's a great game. It is a heavy RPG, so, you know, if you do try it out, I am going to warn you, menus aplenty and lots of reading. There is voice acting in the game, though, so... But in English, even, I mean, the version you were playing was in English, not in Japanese. I played the English version, yes, but you can have it in either Japanese voices or English voices, at least the version I had good. Because I remember playing it in both, and there's one character who, in Japanese, he speaks with Kansai Ben, hmm. but in his English version, he's Welsh. Hmm. So, 
uh, to give a different accent in English. Yeah, they, they give him a different accent. So like the Kansai Ben for Japanese, apparently whoever was doing voice acting was like, oh, by the way, all of the other characters in the game mostly speak with slightly British accents. A lot of them do. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. That's how they differentiated it. Like the main character speaks with a English British accent and the other character who in Japanese speaks with Kansai Ben, he speaks with a Welsh accent. So it is very interesting. It is a game that most of the fighting happens by you like feeding and raising little monsters to fight for you. I say monsters, but it's mostly like little slightly anthropomorphized little bips and bobs is the best way to describe them that you raise and make stronger by giving them candy. Like you give them chocolate and they become stronger. Candy. That's it. Candy. Mostly candy. You can feed them other things, but I think it's mostly candy. (laughs) Sounds fun. All right, Ryan, I found a Calpa soda because I know Calpas is your favorite. Mm -hmm. I hold it dear and close to my heart. Or dear and close to the trash can, either one. Yeah. And this, though, is peach, which usually ranks pretty high for us. Mm Mm-hmm. So, although this is called cold plus peach, who knows why? I hope it doesn't taste like cold syrup. Yeah, well, that's true. I think this is trying to be summer drink, so we're drinking it at the end of the season here. But, surprisingly, this has 10% fruit juice. Did you notice that? I see it. For a kelpis... That's pretty high. Well, I mean, you say that, but the Calpis pineapple also had 10%. Oh, did it? Okay. Yeah. I only know that because I haven't thrown out the bottle yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. All righty. Calpis peach. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it has promise. I'm hopeful. Oh, okay. I thought you were going to say hesitant, but hey, hopeful is pretty good for you and Calpis. Yeah, well, you know what? I like peach. So maybe the peach will make me forget that I'm drinking Calpis. Well, you know, one of the things I'm wondering is the ice cubes on the cover, thinking that you're supposed to think of it as cold, right? Sometimes ice cubes don't taste good, so I'm hoping we're not going to have an ice cube taste. Well, I mean, it would just be more water. (laughs) Yes, to get good, you know, good tasting ice cubes taste like water? Mm Mm-hmm. Or nothing? Yeah. So, yeah, mm-hmm. we'll have to see. Well, I'm willing to give this a shot. Mm-hmm. Ooh, smells rich. Mm. It's a good smell. Yeah. The initial taste isn't as good as the smell, but the peach does come a bit later. The peach flavor is very strong in the aftertaste. Really? Because I got a pretty strong flavor right away. Well, I mean, I think the sweetness comes later in the aftertaste. I mean, it, it tastes like peach. I mean, like mm-hmm. it's strong, rich. Oh, yeah. I mean, the peach flavor kicks into high gear in the aftertaste. Yes. It's there throughout the drink, but it, it really makes itself known when you basically take the drink away. Yeah. I th- I, it tastes like a milky peach, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, not much like Kelpis. Which I enjoy. <laughs> that's, that's where it's doing the right thing for you, huh? Uh-huh. It mm. doesn't taste like Calpis, so you know what? I can potentially get behind this. I think it tastes good. I miss the Calpis a little bit. What? How can you miss Calpis? Because I don't think Calpis is bad. Uh, well, no accounting for taste. <laughs> Do you taste any of the cold plus? What is cold plus supposed to mean? <laughs> I do not know. I don't really taste any cold plus. I mean, it's cold because it was in the fridge, not because the drink made it taste cold. We could have put ice cubes in it. Could have. I, I think that would have just watered it down. Probably. Yeah, I think as a calpus it fails. But as a drink, it does pretty well. I'm curious to see where you land on this because I'm pretty sure I'm going to go higher than you. Oh, yeah, okay. I think I'm thinking eight, Mm. going higher than that. Oh, no, I just thought you were going to go for a seven. Oh, okay. No, I can see an eight here. I am trying to decide if eight's too generous because I think of the other thing. I'm looking at the other eights that I have. 
that's really what it's coming down to. Well, actually, I was looking at Peach Espresso Kelpis, which mm-hmm. I gave an 8 to. But you gave a 6 to, maybe because the Kelpis was too prevalent in that one. It was very prevalent. Yeah. See, my problem is, okay, maybe I won't give it higher than what you are because... Are you going to go to a 7? I was really thinking like a 7.5-ish. <laughs> which rounds up to an 8? Or do you truncate your decimals? <laughs> I'm thinking I might truncate my decimal on this one. <laughs> mm-hmm. Only because I can't, in good conscience, give this the same as I give Raspberry Mitsuya Cider. Mm-hmm. I can give this the same as Ume, but not Raspberry. So for me, a truncated 7.5. <laughs> I think I'll stick with an eight. I mean, I think it fails in the Kalpas thing, but I don't think it necessarily had to succeed there to win. I think it's still good. Actually, I'm correcting myself. I'm rounding up now. After a few more tastes, it's tasting better. After one more taste, it gets a round up on that taste. Look at that. We got Ryan to give an eight to a Kalpas. Because it doesn't taste like Kalpas. <laughs> As for the snacks today, we did find some more Kit Kats. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you brought a salt lemon Kit Kat. Salt lemon. Mm-hmm. This one seems very interesting. I am scared but intrigued. I don't blame you. Oh, and there's two different colors of wrapper. I was able to get both colors of wrapper in the picture. Mm-hmm. Blue and white. I have a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. Are they the same inside? I would think so. Probably. Yep, they look identical. It is very pale yellow. That being said, I am seeing salt flecks in it. At least in one of mine. I saw some salt flecks. I don't think I see that. Or at least I thought I saw one. Hmm. Maybe I'm just seeing things. I might just be seeing things. I'm seeing a little summer melting is what happened. (laughs) Didn't quite get it in the fridge fast enough, I think. It does smell pretty strongly of lemon. It does. Not a bad lemon. No. A different lemon than I expected. I don't know what I expected, but a different lemon than I expected. Were you expecting a CC lemon? (laughs) Maybe. I don't know what I was expecting. Yeah. But it smells pretty strongly of lemon. It does. I don't know how to explain. It smells a little bit artificial lemon, not lemon. Maybe I was thinking too true lemon flavor Mm. i don't know does that make sense yeah it makes sense but i'm gonna tell you a secret the kit kat it's got artificial flavoring (laughs) what there was not 30 lemons no lemons were harmed in the making of this kit kat (laughs) oh well at least i don't believe they were (laughs) all right let's see hmm I think the salt and the lemon work together better than I expected. About what I expected, but I would... Again, I like the salt and sweet flavor mix. Mm. I think I expected the salt to be a bit more overpowering. Mm-mm. And the lemon is, is stronger, which I think is the right kind of mix. I think it's a good flavor. I'm real happy with this one. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that... I'm just going to come right out and say it. I think this is another eight. I'm real happy with the flavors today. I don't think I'm going to give it an 8. Here's again why I'm giving it an 8. Again, it's rounding error. (laughs) But it's because I feel like I look at my 7s, and I enjoyed those. But I feel like this is better than the 7s. So the 7s that I gave this past year were white with salt and honeycomb. And I think that this salt combination works better than white with salt. Mm-hmm. And I think that while Honeycomb was good, I think this is a more solid flavor in my book. So with rounding error, it is better than those sevens. So that's why an eight. I think it's the salt flavor that I'm not liking so much. Well, I recall how you felt about the white with salt. Yeah. The lemon's not bad. And the lemon with salt is not terrible. I think I'm going to give it a six. It's above passing. You know, I'll eat it. I'll eat some more. Mm-hmm. But I don't think it's a favorite. Between having more of these and having, I don't know, like a peach cake cat. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'd go to the peach. Yeah. Now, compared to the other eights that I've given in the past, like mint, I would take the mint. 
So you know, we haven't scored anything at ten. Our, our ten point scale is not really ten points. Well, that's because nothing's perfect yet. Well, we did score a zero and some nines, so I guess that is ten points. <laughs> so today. I had you read a book that is all about baking. Mm -hmm. Everything's about baking. And so I think what we decided to do today was we decided to think about baked goods and the joys that different pastries can bring us. And so I ask you, Nate, can you tell me about two of your favorite pastries? Yep, I think I can pick two favorite pastries. That I can probably do. I don't have a whole lot of stories about the pastries, but I can definitely pick pastries. Yeah, I don't have a lot of stories about pastries. I think first I will pick a Japanese favorite that I did not know about until I came here. Mm -hmm. And that is Melon Pon. Not Anpon? Not Anpon. No. Uh, yeah, Anpon's pretty popular. Mm -hmm. There's even a Mon. Anpan Man or Anpan Man? <laughs> Would you say Anpan Man? No, you don't. You say Anpan Man, but he is a superhero, like Superman. But you say Anpan Man. Anyway. Anyway, I've distracted you. You make the joke because Melon Pan is Anpan Man's friend, right? Melon Pan Man or something like that. I don't even know what his real name is. Mm. But Melon Pan is yeah Anpan Man's friend. Anyway, but I do like Melon Pan, and it is a. Funny looking bread, but that makes it easy to find for people who don't read Japanese very well <laughs> when you first arrive. <laughs> it's a, a half dome shaped bread that has grooves on it in a grid pattern. So it looks quite fun, but melon pond is pretty good. It's nice and I like it because it's kind of crunchy and sweet on the top and then just very fluffy in the middle. Mm -hmm. It is really good. Yeah. There's a variation in my local grocery store where they make melon pond looking bread but they fill it with maple. So it's more of a maple bread, and that's really good too. But I like melon pond a lot. So you can get it at the 100 yen convenience stores mm -hmm. or just regular convenience stores for 100 yen usually. There are varying qualities, <laughs> and I don't yeah. always land on the right ones by mistake. But, hey, you know, even the poor quality ones aren't terrible. No, and I think one of the ones that I always remember is when I first came to Japan... There was a local bakery that loved doing what they called, I think it was like Kamelon Pan, but it was spelled Kame Melon Pan uh -huh. because it was Melon Pan in the shape of a turtle. So they took the cross hatching of a melon bread and added basically a turtle to it. And so it was Kame and Melon Pan smooshed together. Mm hmm. Uh, kame meaning turtle, of course. Yeah, so anyway, I like melon pond. That is my first choice. I do have one pastry that has a story behind it, potentially. And that is, whenever I go home, there is a local donut shop that my dad loves to go to. And I love these donuts that he always brings back from there. They are really delicious they are like buttermilk donuts but they are buttermilk bars but he buys them nice and fresh and then because it's a very far distance to this donut shop from where my parents currently live they will then freeze a whole bunch of them and then on usually like saturday mornings pull one of the buttermilk bars out heat it up and it's nice and soft and warm and just so delicious. So for me, part of that is the taste of like this really delicious buttermilk bar. But part of it is also that taste of really that taste of home, that taste of remembering like Saturday mornings with my parents and things like that. So that is one of those really good Buttermilk donut. Mm. You can't say no to that kind of donut. Sounds good. All right, I am going to pick. So one of the things that was told to me pretty quickly after coming here is they warned me, you know, be careful of the Japanese donut stores. The donuts in Japan are not as sweet as America. I was like, hmm, okay, sure. But of course I went anyway. Of course. Because Mr. Donuts, it's pretty prevalent here in Japan. 
And for a while, there was one very close to our train station. So it was easy to stop there. But I went <laughs> and I tried them. And, you know, yeah, sure, some of the donuts are not sweet. But there are a lot of pretty sweet Japanese donuts. Mm-hmm. And maybe I've gotten accustomed to the not sweetness of Japanese donuts. But, but there are still some pretty sweet Japanese donuts. And maybe Americans' ones are still sweeter. But I don't know. I don't mind the level of sweetness. No, it's. I feel like it's a good level. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I'm going to pick Honey Old Fashioned from Ooh, Mr. Donuts. That is a good call. Good call. Honey Old Fashioned. In fact, the Mr. Donuts that was here at our station stopped carrying it for a while. And you're like, wait a minute. What? How can you not carry Honey Old Fashioned? Like, they didn't even make it. That's like one of the signature flavors, though. I know, of Mr. Donuts. It's like always there. I don't know. I was surprised. But they stocked it again before they closed, and then they closed. So, oh well. But Honey Old Fashioned from Mr. Donuts. There is a Mr. Donuts on either station one stop from us. <laughs> so I do occasionally go and get donuts from one station away. Mr. Donuts is not bad. I think if you try, like, say, an Angel Cream and compare it to a Dunkin' Donuts Angel Cream, yeah, it's not a sweet but you know what? It's sweet enough. <laughs> it's pretty good. Yeah, you don't need that much sweetness. <laughs> it's sweet where it counts. Mm -hmm. The cream is sweet. I guess the donut part itself might be a bit more just blander. But mm. to me, that's balancing out nicely the sweet in the middle. And maybe I'm just not a teenager anymore, which is very true. <laughs> but I don't know. I like them. I do appreciate the honey old-fashioned more than the old-fashioned mm. without honey. So I used to live at one of the station's like a station away from us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and unfortunately because of that time i did live right by the mr donuts over there and so usually that was a regular weekend stop for me well i mean and for you who likes coffee it's bottomless coffee out of mr donuts now you are catching on to why it was a weekend trip for me is i would go there usually i would order two donuts and a coffee and just sit there for hours reading books and just relaxing at Mr. Donuts. Oh, it was a trap. I can see that to be an easy trap to fall into. That being said, pretty much I always got a honey old fashioned and then the other one would vary. Some days, if I was feeling like I wanted something a little bit richer, I would go for the angel cream. But oftentimes I would also go for one of the pondering types. Oh, yeah, those are good, too. And and those, I would also say, are generally not as sweet as American donuts. But again, they're sweet where it counts, so does it really matter? Yeah, but I also feel like they they feel fluffier is the best way to describe it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's good. If you come to Japan, visit a Mr. Donuts. Potentially, I can warn you that it's not as sweet, but I can also advise you that it's still very good, so enjoy it. That being said, you do realize that Mr. Donuts is also in America, right? <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I only go to Dunkin' Donuts where I lived. <laughs> I only say that because I do believe Mr. Donuts was founded in America. <laughs> <laughs> Just not New Jersey, I guess, huh? Uh, definitely not. See, the only reason I knew that it was originally from America was because, and this goes to show how many times on a, a Saturday morning I was there drinking coffee, but they did have some branding that talked about being founded in America on one of their walls. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So the last baked good that I really want to talk about today is coffee cake. Okay. And that is because, A... You're addicted to coffee. Well, there's not really coffee in the coffee cake. <laughs> oh. Actually, I did have a really good chocolate cake recipe that I used regularly for a number of years that had cold coffee right in the mix. You just substitute half the water for cold coffee, and it just smooths out that chocolate flavor so that it's nice and fluffy and really moist. Sorry, I digress. <laughs> so yes, if you're going to make a chocolate cake, my recommendation, this is a Ryan recommendation, substitute about half the water for cold coffee, brewed coffee, and you just cool it down, substitute about half of it, and it will give you a nice balanced flavor and smooth out the chocolate and also make it really moist cake all right so back to about coffee cake <laughs> one of the things that i really like about coffee cake is i really like cinnamon and pretty much every coffee cake has cinnamon right there but also again i think this has to do with a lot of 
family memories because this was one of those, for me growing up, this was every Christmas morning was coffee cake. We would gather around, we would retell the nativity story, go through the whole story of, well, why do we celebrate Christmas and read scripture and then all have coffee cake? That was how we did every Christmas. And maybe not every Christmas, but it was a number of Christmases. And then, of course, in my family, it always so happened that the youngest person had to then go climb underneath the tree and gather all the presents to hand out to everybody else who was there. And me being generally the youngest at all of these meant that every Christmas that was me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I guess for me, part of it is the fact that I love coffee cake because again, for me, it, it comes back to those memories. This is tied so tightly to all my memories of spending Christmas morning with my family, but also of Christmas. So for me, coffee cake will always remind me of Christmas. And I really like Christmas. Christmas is a lovely time of the year. I mean, you get to gather gather together with people you like and watch a Muppet Christmas Carol. And Die Hard. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Christmas with the Cranks. Eh, not as much. <laughs> Do you think the smells bring back... The smells definitely bring back that memory because I think it's the spices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the thing is like a lot of Christmas baked goods tend to have like lots of lots of spices in it. Your cinnamons, your nutmegs, a lot of those kind of spices, those smells are can be pretty reminiscent, cause you to really linger in those memories, I think. Sounds good to me. You had me read a book. I had you read a book. Which is good. This was a book that I felt was a bit of a different flavor from some of the other books that I've had you read. And by that, I mean, for the first time, I think the young adult book was suggested by one Ryan Smith. Mm -hmm. Most of the books that tend to be geared for younger audiences, you have brought forward, mostly because you have read them either in your own past or because your kids are currently reading them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But this one was one that I said, oh, this sounds like an interesting premise. And so I read it and thought, hey, I really like this story. This is a fun story. I'm going to make Nate read this. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And. But what was your incentive to get it in the first place? Um, Honestly, I was trying to figure out what to read and. Uh, I came across the summary, and it just sounded like a great summary. Um, I think I think I read the summary on Goodreads and just went, "Oh, oh, this is this sounds like right up my alley. I'm gonna try that." For those who don't know what we're going to talk about, this book is called "A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking," which is all about a wizard who defensively bakes. Mm-hmm. I I'm I kid, but for those of you who haven't read it, I do say that it is a fun read, and I very much enjoyed it, and I do recommend that you read it. So, if you haven't read it yet, go ahead and take a moment, pause the podcast, go and read it, and then come back and join us after that. But if you've already read it and you want a refresher, well, I'll give you a quick little rundown of the story. You see... Mona is a wizard, but not one of those flying, fireball-throwing kind of wizards. She has the power over baked goods, which is appropriate as she works in a bakery. And she's happy and comfortable in that life. Until one day, she comes into work, and there's a dead girl on the bakery floor. That incident revealed to her a world where wizards are being hunted just because there's one guy who really wants to rule over everything... And he wanted everything he couldn't control gone. And so to save the city, Mona, her gingerbread soldier, and a couple of her friends have to hide from an assassin, climb up a castle's poop chute, and eventually lead an army of bread golems and a carnivorous sourdough starter to fight against an invading army. Along the way, she does discover her own strength, 
how the magic works, and the tragedy of being a hero, and the fallibility of adults who really should be having the whole thing figured out by now. Sounds good. All right. So, as I said, this was a bit of a change from the norm that I have you read. But what was your reaction to it? How did you feel about it? I think it was good. And I think that, for whatever reason, when you first introduced it to me, maybe it's the title is like A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking. Like Maybe it's the title threw me off or something threw me off at the beginning that I was like, I don't know if this book's going to be good. And maybe it's the fact that it's called Guide. You mean you judged the book by its title? Possibly. I mean, like, why am I reading a guidebook kind of thing, right? Mm. And you forced me to read a good book. So you're not going to force me to read something bad, like Ember's book two. I kept reading. I was like, oh, this is not bad. Oh, this book's not bad. Oh, okay. This book, this book is getting better. So, you know, throughout the book, I just kept thinking like, oh, okay. I, you know, I can get used to this book. I think that was something that was kind of funny through my reading. I was like, okay, yeah, this book's good. <laughs> oh, surprise. Ryan picked a good book. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, well, you know, when have you led me astray? Um, not too often. <laughs> well, there's a couple of books that I really like that you don't, so, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's, well, except for, yes, How to Lose the Time War. Okay, you led me astray there. But that's different. I didn't lead you astray. You just have different tastes. I have different paths. I'm on a different path. Anyway... <laughs> Let's get this out of the way first. I think one of the things that was interesting to me was the similarities in this book to Hero of Ages, I think, is probably the most direct parallel. Okay. Where it's people preparing for a siege. Mm. Isn't Hero of Ages the one with the Koloth outside the wall? Yes, that would be Hero of Ages. Yeah, so this felt like that a little bit to me. Mm. We're preparing for somebody coming in. I think what I liked about this one better. Was it had hope? <laughs> <laughs> it had more hope. Nah, I'm not sure this one had hope. No, I, I think I like this one better because Mona had more direct impact on the outcome of the fight. Mm, Whereas yeah. Hero of Ages, Vin was just off running somewhere else or she was defeating someone else, something like that. Anyway. She, it, she was off fighting in another area of the country and then found out about what was happening in Elendil. <laughs> no, Lucidel. Lucidel. Sorry, Ellendel's in... In the new <laughs> the books, yeah. New books, sorry. <laughs> the, well, that and... She wasn't fighting Ruin then. She was fighting something else. She was fighting... No, yeah, well, she was. She was. Ruin had been locked away. Hero of Ages was when Ruin was basically revealing themselves. She was in one of the cities trying to find uh, the Lord Emperor's caches, if I remember mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was trying to do her superhero thing that the superhero has to do. Yeah. And then everybody else has to do their thing so that the city doesn't fall. So I mean, I, this one's different than the fact that Mona was directly participating in the defense of the city, mm-hmm. where in Hero of Ages, the hero was not participating in the defense of the city. So not a big deal. I mean, in some ways, I, I like that better, that the hero was participating in the defense of the city. Although I did find it interesting that Knackering Molly is really the one who defeated them. Mm-hmm. Although it's not like Mona did nothing. Mona did a lot of things. Yeah. Potentially the more visible things. Not to say that the horses running through town were invisible, but for mm. somehow they were past more normal <laughs> well than after the fight. Well, I think it's the fact that, like, especially if you think of the time... Mona was defending the town for a prolonged period of time using her bread golems, using all of these different things, her evil gingerbread men. Mm -hmm. She was doing that for a prolonged period of time, whereas Nackering Molly was, it's time to end this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So the amount of time that people were able to see her defending the city, basically, was less than the amount of time they saw Mona standing up there defending the city. I think that had partly to do with that. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. At least from my perspective. One of the things that confused me early on was the number of fake endings there are in this book. (laughs) Yes, yes. There are so many of those. I mean, like, I thought, okay, okay, so she's going to work her way to the Duchess, and then that'll be the book, and she'll get there, she'll tell the Duchess, and the story will be over. Oh, no, wait a minute. She's going to make it to the Duchess in the next half hour. Oh, wait a minute. She's now at the Duchess's. We're only halfway through the book. So 
there was some other maybe minor false endings, but that middle one was like, whoa, okay, we're not ending. We're still going on. Yeah, there were a lot of things where you were like, they're setting up for endgame here. Wait, there's still a lot of time left. They're not setting up for endgame yet. Yeah, because you thought, oh, it's going to be accomplished when they get to the Duchess. Mm -hmm, Okay. mm -hmm. All right. Then maybe when they get the bad guy out of town. No, no. No, All right. Well, uh, (laughs) and yeah, so it was basically every time they accomplish something great, you were like, yes, they did it. They've saved the day. Oh, maybe they didn't quite save the day yet. Yeah, I do like that because it just it made it feel very much a like a part of it, like a part of the reading, right? Yeah, exactly. And it also felt like, hey, they have these successes, but the villain, the antagonist also isn't just going to back down. They're going to still keep acting in their own interest. No, I, I really liked it. I really liked that part. I think the biggest thing that I liked about this book was its kind of core message that simple magic is only simple because you haven't explored... Well, uh, well, I don't know if that's the exact meaning of the book, but it definitely implies that simple can be powerful. Simple can be creative. Mm -hmm. Simple can have power in its creativity. You just have to think up the right things. Yeah. Well, Mona hadn't played with too much of it. Like She did learn a bunch of things from her book, and she probably has a lot more she can learn. Mm. There was... An underlying, like, yeah, you can only move bread, but hey, you can make a speaker and a microphone out of bread. Yeah, and I think part of that is the core idea of, like, hey, as long as you're thinking through these things and being creative and trying and pushing yourself, you can do a lot with a little. I mean, one of the examples they used was, like, one of the most deadly assassins had the power over roses. (laughs) Or something like that. They mentioned that in the throwaway line at one point. And we found out that the golden general, he could move lightning Mm -hmm. or rain clouds. Or storms or or the weather in some way. So yeah, I, I like the underlying theme. I think that can be applied to a lot of things in our life. I also liked the thing they talked about with heroes. How so many times being marked as a hero in so many people's eyes usually means that nobody really wants to go through what it takes to be a hero. The idea of being a hero is like this, oh yeah, you're standing up, you're doing what's right. But oftentimes it means a lot of really rough times. And nobody really wants to have to do that. But, you know, stepping up and doing what's right is still important. Like, it's that almost, like, cynical view of being marked as a hero, but also understanding that, hey, it's still important to do what's right. Yeah. Yes. And I, yeah, I liked that theme, too. Why did you pick this book as a favorite? I mean, I don't think you often pick young adult books. I don't. Not that you never do. I mean, I, I guess you could sometimes categorize some of the Brandon Sanderson as young adult. Yeah. I don't generally read a lot of young adult fiction. Mostly because I've been burned by young adult fiction before when I read it and... And I, for- and I force you to read it? Well, no, it's actually not that. Honestly, it's the ones that I read and I feel like I've just read the same story 13 times before. And I know that's not the case in a lot of good young adult fiction, but I've been burned by it a lot. And so, yeah, you're right. I don't tend to offer up a lot. But I think what really stood out to me was a couple of things. Number one, I really liked the style of magic in this world. The magic in this world was often, if you have some sort of magic in you, you have power over something. And you can do magic by building up a connection with that thing whether that is bread or roses or horse corpses. (laughs) But you can build up that connection and you can potentially do a lot of things as long as you're creative by utilizing that connection. And so I really liked that, but I also really liked 
the narration style and how it effectively captured the voice of a 14 year old girl in the middle of a war. That's how I felt is like it really got her voice down well because it was being told from this perspective. I was able to forgive a lot of things that I would normally be a little bit more picky about in adult fiction. In more adult fiction, if there was any sort of, I wouldn't say plot hole, but like any sort of thing that like I didn't get all the details about, I would get a little like, eh, why aren't you telling me everything? But this, because it was being told from the perspective of the 14-year-old girl, you got the impression that, no, you are learning everything that she knows from what she knows. Mm -hmm. So there might be more to this world, but she just doesn't know it. And so I did like that. It did that well. It spoke with her voice very well. Because you're led to believe early on that her magic isn't valuable only because of her perspective. Yeah. Aside from those things, everything that you've already said pretty much covers exactly why I really enjoyed this book. And it was, for me, I think it was a breath of fresh air because I had just gotten through reading a bunch of other books that felt very samey, that this felt like something fresh and new. So for all those reasons and potentially more, that is why I said, no, I want you to read this. I enjoyed it. And this was the first book that I have read from this author. And she has a number of other books and many of them have won awards. Oh, okay. Yeah. I might have to give her another shot with one of her other books because she doesn't have any like sequels or more series for this character. She does have a couple of other series that I might uh, might be willing to give a shot to sometime soon. Mm -hmm. And I'll let you know how those go. Sounds good. Yeah, I think this one won an award too, right? This one. Yeah, this one won an award too. Yeah, good stuff. Which I think is how it ended up in my Goodreads feed was the fact that it had won awards and they were like, with all the other books that you've read, this is another one that <laughs> maybe would be good for you. You appear to be reading... Good books. Here's another good book. <laughs> <laughs> you appear to be reading good books and a lot of fantasy. Mm -hmm. And occasionally some young adult fiction. <laughs> and occasionally some comedy. I think this will fit your niche. So, Nate, next week, mm -hmm. I'm finally launching my trap, I think. <laughs> finally springing, springing the trap or launching the trap? Yes. It's launching me into the trap? I'm launching you into the trap. Oh, no. That trap is, I've gotten you to record now 65 episodes with me. <laughs> and now I want to introduce you to one of my favorite worlds. One of the things that I have enjoyed doing for many years. And I want you just to experience that same joy. Nate, I'm going to have you play a one-shot D&D game. Sounds good. Am I going to need a 20-sided die? Don't you worry. I can provide all the dice you need. Well, I can use dice by Peacock, too. You could use dice by Peacock, but you'll probably need a 20-sided. My guess is you'll probably need a 10-sided. You'll probably need an 8-sided, maybe even a 4-sided, uh, definitely a 6-sided. <laughs> Do they make it complicated, huh? Uh... Well, to that end... We are going to have a little game. We're going to invite Keith, who's been on the episodes before. He's going to run a game with us. And since I thought it'd be uh, good to have two other players with us to help give you that impression, I grabbed two other people who have played Dungeons & Dragons with me before. And so we'll have Nash and Zach with us, I believe. And we're going to have a lovely little game. We're going to play a game together. On that note, we hope that you found something nice about this hill that we were willing to die on. And we appreciate all of our listeners coming along with us on this journey. And if you ever thought to yourself, I really like these guys, and I really like what they do, and I wish there was some way that I could support them, know that you can. Visit myhilltodieon.com slash members for more details. But what does it mean to be a member? 
Well, for the low, low price of $2 a month or $15 a year, you can help support this podcast. And by doing so, you'll get access to the members only podcast, not my hill, which is where we discuss all the things that we are not really willing to die on that hill for. We have very strong opinions about them, but as the title says, they're definitely not hills that we'd be willing to die on. In addition to that, you will also get access to the suggestion form where you can make suggestions for our listener hill episodes, where we will watch, read, or climb up a hill that you're willing to die on, and we talk all about it. But know that the conversation doesn't have to end here. The discussion can continue with us through Reddit at the subreddit My Hill to Die On, or by contacting us through Twitter at My Hill to Die On, or you can reach us by email, which is to no one's surprise, My Hill to Die On at gmail.com. And finally, we upload all of our episodes to our YouTube channel, which is also named, say it with me now, folks, My Hill to Die On. And we talk about these experiences to see if we can get just one more person <laughs> to join us on our hill to die on. We might as well just change it now. Get just. <laughs> None of us can say just get. <laughs> In that order. There we go. Get just. Now it's always get just. Now, now that we've corrected that, we're going to do it. Just, <laughs> just get. get. Just get one more. Oh, well. I finished the uh, Golem and the Genie today. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. It was a longer book than I was anticipating, I think, because it did take me two weeks, although it was two weeks in the middle of me getting the year going, so. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to listen to it again. I'm going to have to listen to it at like 3x speed, though. (laughs) I'm trying to decide where it lands, because I've been trying to be good about actually ranking the books that I've been reading. I'm sitting there going, is that a four? Is that a five? Because they, of course, only have whole number stars. Why can't I get decimal <laughs> points here? <laughs> Not just me, Ryan. That's a smaller scale, too. For my ranking system, I tend to like have the broad categories of these are the five stars, these are the four stars, and then within the four stars, I definitely do have a ranking within them. Mm-hmm. Whereas, like, I look at some of my other four stars and I'm like, this definitely beats that, but but this other one I can't really consider a five-star book. Again, it's because they have a limited number of stars I can give. Can we move to a ten-star scale? <laughs> give me decimals, at least. <sighs> give me half a moment. I'm going to grab the snacks from the refrigerator and take a quick look at my shelf just to figure out which ones I haven't talked about yet. I can always talk about Disco Zoo. Yeah, no. <laughs> Be right back. Mm-hmm. All right, and the Kit Kat that we were doing was the um, the the one in the uh, the lemon one. Let's do the salty lemon. All right. All right. So this so week, r- yeah, grabbing, r- rummaging, rummaging. All right, I- I've rummaged. I'm done. <laughs> You can put that at the beginning. <laughs> I promise I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> no context sure. is better. What do we give a zero to? Kiwi Mikachu. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, and I gave Pepsi zero a one. <laughs> you gave it a two. How did you give Pepsi a two? I don't know. I think I was feeling generous. <laughs> I think I was feeling generous that night because it probably deserved a one in <laughs> retrospect. <laughs> Anyway, and in fact, you know what? I'm thinking that I might just post, uh, posthumously. No, no, no. Posthumously, put it, put it in the notes. Make it a comment. <laughs> Should have been a one. Posthumously. Posthumously. Not posthumously, because that would mean you know, I would be dead. Right. Well, the or episode least... is dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, that episode's not out yet, so I could always go back in and change it. <laughs> Wait, which episode is that? Uh, Shadows of Self. Oh, my goodness. That's the one that I am currently working on. Hey, if you want to change it in the episode, fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we got to well, get gotta get posting these episodes, I guess. Well, I mean, we're not from here. 
we recorded that at the beginning of the summer, right? Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Because if I remember right, I read that while I was out at oh, Yamanaka. Yamanaka. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was pretty early in the summer. Yeah, we got to get these episodes out. <laughs> By the time we uh, get the Severance episode out, maybe Seasonal 2 will be out. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking I was mentioning October in my thing, which will have way past by the time this episode comes up. But anyway, oh well. We'll see what happens. We're just having fun. You know what? In the end, it's going to be a podcast that we just keep recording and not releasing. <laughs> hey, you know, we recorded our conversations. Who knows when we release them? Well, you know, we have a lot of episodes out of time. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Except none of ours really need to be timely. No, 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 they don't. Although we talk about the summer by the time we release it, it's the winter, but oh well. Well, maybe, maybe we should start talking about, oh, Ooh, it's so cold outside right now. Can't you feel how cold it is? <laughs> we should start recording our episodes and releasing them a year later. And then it, then it doesn't... And then people come up to us, you finally bought an iPhone 14? <laughs> oh, well. Yeah, I don't think that would necessarily work, especially because that would mean that we should really have 23 episodes in the can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I think that you might have an issue with that. I would not like it, yeah. You're keeping me from Star Trek again because there's a new Lower Decks episode. <sighs> you know, I always keep you from Star Trek, though. I know, you always keep me from Star Trek. But last time was Star Trek Picard. Mm-hmm. But they just released a new trailer of Star Trek Picard. It's looking good. It's got the original... Ca- this is going to be an amazing season, I think. <laughs> Picard with the original TNG cast. <sighs> it's going to be good. Streaming right. February 16, so not quite uh, yet. On on Paramount Plus? On Paramount Plus. <laughs> anything in Japan? Well, it doesn't say anything. So my question is, when are they going to do the the whole like international rollout thing? Like, okay, they said that they were going to do something international in 2022 for Paramount Plus, and you know what? It's coming to the end of 2022. They still got a couple months left. And they had paid Netflix not to put out the international stuff yet because they were like, oh, we'll just wait till we have it all ready. And then on countries we're not doing Paramount Plus, like Japan, then Netflix can release it on those. Like, so come on already. Uh, So I want my Discovery Season 4. And, you know, who's going to start showing... Strange New Worlds, which seems like apparently is an amazing show, which I would love to watch. Yeah, come on, come on. At least Picard and Lower Decks have both been picked up by Amazon Prime in Japan. So I will get to see them there. Mm. And Discovery Season 4, I'm assuming, will return to Netflix whenever Paramount Plus releases it. Mm. Although, actually, I wonder if it could be stuck in the limbo like Discovery Season 4 is. Maybe I will get mad again. Although Lower Decks came out... Don't you worry, I'll be there to, you know, twist the knife a little bit if it does. Yikes. Yeah, well, although I guess Lower Decks is prime, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that they, they, Amazon paid Netflix not to release stuff. They didn't necessarily pay Amazon Prime to not release stuff. So hopefully Picard Season 4 will come out, uh, or Season 3. But Discovery Season 4, I'd like to see, and Strange New Worlds, I'd like to see. So, yeah, anyway, come on. Come on, Paramount, get your stuff in order so that the rest of the world can watch your shows. Yeah, well, you know, it's Paramount. So the problem with trying to... Uh, yeah, search it in Japan. Could all the Japanese ones come right up. Yeah. Founded in 1955 in America. Mm-hmm. Wholly owned subsidiary of what? Where? Uh, on on Wikipedia. Um, In Japan, Mr. Donuts is owned by the Mitsui conglomerate. Oh, in America, it was bought by Allied... Uh, whatever, something else. And most of its stores became Dunkin' Donuts. Mm. Uh, they were purchased by a United Kingdom company in America. Only one business still uses the Mr. Donut name in Godfrey, Illinois. Huh. So yes, uh, Mr. Donuts was originally from America. There's just none left in mm-hmm. America. Well, one left in America. Hmm. Oh, they bought it in 1989. See, the only reason I knew that it was originally from America was because, and this goes to show how many times on a a Saturday morning I was there drinking coffee, but they did have some branding that talked about being founded in America. 
mm-hmm. on one of their walls. Yeah, we got to cut out the uh, Nate and Ryan read Wikipedia section. <laughs> what? Everybody loves the Nate and Ryan read Wikipedia sections. Uh, I'm not so sure. We could make a whole trivia game just based on trying to find things in Wikipedia. <laughs> mm. Oh, wait, no. That's already been done. Mm-hmm. All right, so one more piece of baked goods for me. See, the problem is trying to limit it to one. You know what? I'm going to have to say it. When in doubt, there is always the original glazed Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> oh, okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Talk about a sweet donut. Talk about a sweet donut. I like fresh, moist donuts. And nothing fits that bill quite as much as the original glazed Krispy Kreme donut. It is very sweet very powerful wait a second hold up why am i saying this oh you're changing i think i might change Mm. because yeah yeah i'm changing because there's too many baked goods that i love Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because so my brain went to the Krispy Kreme donut because i love actually no i am going to change so let's rewind it back so the last baked good that I really want to talk about today is coffee cake. So you like how I said I didn't have any stories and then suddenly remembered I had stories? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You have a story <laughs> of Christmas. You're sneaking it in there. What can I say? Christmas. It's that time of the year, September, when we start to think about <laughs> think Christmas. About Christmas. <laughs> well, you know, two weeks ago there was Halloween decorations in the store. I was like, man, it's late August. Come on. Oh, well. Yeah, no, you know, you you hit September, you start preparing for Halloween, and then the moment Halloween ends, you have to start preparing for Christmas. Mm-hmm. I don't even think they'll wait for the end of Halloween, but that's okay. No, oh, no, I think they wait for the end of Halloween. And by the end of Halloween, I mean Halloween Day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, you know, I think that's kind of why I like the fall and winter time, is because it's like celebration after celebration. And... <laughs> You know what? I like these. These are good celebrations. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I don't know about Halloween, but... Well, I mean, I enjoy all of the things that get to happen around Halloween. I haven't done anything big for Halloween in years, so... But, you know, at the very least, lots of good games come out around Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> you there? Mm, sorry, nope, I'm dozing. Yeah. Oh, goodness. Sorry. Yeah, no what worries. What was your last sorry. line there? <laughs> I, I missed your last line. <laughs> Good night. Oh, sorry, Ryan. <laughs> I'm having problems today. <laughs> well, you got up at like two in the morning. Well, five, but still. Well, five. One 30. in the morning. <laughs> well, we're recording early too today. It's only 1030. Yeah, it's only 1030. On that note. Sounds good. Plosives. <laughs> <laughs>